This is the Invincible Podcast on TV Podcast Industries, and this time we're talking about Invincible Episode 6, You Look Kinda Dead. What's your problem, Sinclair? My problem? My problem is this school of idiots. MIT courted me. Yale offered me a lab. You should take it. <laughs> You're impressive, Rick. Muscular, assertive, classic alpha male. Hey, don't say those compliments to him. Mr. Sinclair, you can return when you're ready to learn. Then I'll see you at exams, Rick. Welcome back, fellow Guardians. It is I, Chris, and you're listening to the Invincible Podcast on TV Podcast Industries. This time we're talking about Invincible Episode 6, Season 1, You Look Kinda Dead. And I'm not talking to my illustrious (laughs) co-host. Yes, after three podcasts a week for six weeks, I feel kind of dead. But we're, we're down to two now, Chris. We're just down to Invincible and Falcon of the Winter Soldier every week now on the TV Podcast Industries. Uh, finished up the second season of uh, Pennyworth last week. And all I can say was the ending was batty. Uh, that's, my little, uh, that's, that's my little bat uh, joke for, uh, for the batverse story of Pennyworth. There you go. Bat, batty. Almost it's, mad. It was, it was the most... Uh, I think we called it the most Gotham esque episode of Pennyworth, and definitely the most uh, most comic booky episode. But uh, but yeah, really uh, enjoyed the final episode of that show, and hopefully we'll get a season three of Pennyworth. It's a very small show on a very small channel in the US and in the UK, so uh, so we're not too sure what the uh, what the necessary audience is for a third season of that show but hopefully we'll get that back uh, in the future in the same way as you said on, on invincible you know we're on season one of invincible only a couple of episodes left on that hopefully this one has picked up enough of an audience to get a second season as well I, i'm I, i'm thinking so mm-hmm. this this has very much been a i'd like to say like an acquired taste but it's been a word of mouth his popularity has just grown it started with an acquired taste. You had to either know Invincible or the, kind of the boys or kind of been in a circle where people might have talked about this upcoming show. Yeah. Uh, or know Kirkman or Walking Dead. Like, it was very much a... I don't want to use the word term niche, mm-hmm. but it was kind of niche. Yeah, And yeah. it's just each week on... And I'm using Twitter and, it, and kind of Instagram. I'm using the web as a kind of gradient here but like i'm seeing more and more top people talking about invincible mm-hmm. fridays each week and then i'm seeing ed brubaker who was on um uh, fat man beyond mm-hmm. he talked uh, about invincible yeah and you're like you're going like okay p- more and more and more and more people are talking about this show yeah absolutely I, th- I think what i've been seeing more often than not is the clip of the uh, the fight at the end of episode one yeah I call it a fight, but the slaughter at the end of episode one <laughs> just being shared. The bloodbath. Exactly, but just being shared randomly in the middle of every type of group of, of fandoms that I've seen. Just that clip is being shared there, and then everybody going, Ooh, I must check that show out. I didn't realize it was like that. <laughs> so I'm kind of wondering, you know, does that ruin it for you? Because that is the big moment of the first episode, and we, we get that massive violent moment in the first episode as as the original Guardian of the Globe get killed. And I wonder, is that does that ruin the experience for you going in if you think the show is going to be all that? Uh, or or does it set you up properly for, for the show? Because it is spoilers, but we are six weeks in. You should have been on it from episode one. <laughs> should have been. But if you're not, welcome. Exactly. You may be listening in the past or in the future. What is time? But <laughs> hopefully you have subscribed to our series so that you're getting all the next couple of episodes that are coming. If not, head on over to tvpodcastindustry.com where you can subscribe on any Guardians of the Globe or Mauler Twin associated podcast catcher. You can also leave us a review. You can like, share, subscribe and all that fun stuff. But mm-hmm. more importantly, you can also leave us feedback because we got some cool feedback and we're even kicking off a new section, but we'll talk about that later on in the podcast. Yep. You can also help keep our illustrious editor and producer 
in caffeine by heading on to patreon.com slash TV podcast industries because we've been doing three shows a week mm-hmm. for you, our beautiful Patreons and subscribers and listeners, and in this case, Guardians. Or you can now also go to buymeacoffee.com slash TVPI, where That's you can it. literally buy him a coffee, which yeah. I still think is the best thing in the world. It's really, it's really good, isn't it? Yeah, it's a one-off, a one-off uh, contribution towards my coffee. Well, now addiction, I suppose. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but on Patreon, if you want to support us for any amount monthly, it'll keep the keep the lights on, as Chris said. And really, a huge thank you to everybody that's joined us over on Patreon and who's bought me a coffee because because uh, I've gotten a few uh, since we uh, since we started over there. It's been really, really nice. We're going to turn into espresso martinis at a certain point. Oh, absolutely yes. Post <laughs> post nine p.m. editing, I promise you, it's not usually done sober. Uh, <laughs> yes. But let's move on and talk about the one, the only, episode six. You look kind of dead. Derek, do you want to tell us what they gave us? Absolutely. Once again, the series was created by Robert Kirkman, Corey Walker, and Ryan Otley. This episode was written by Curtis Gwynn. Uh, Curtis Gwynn wrote two episodes of Stranger Things, one that's already been broadcast, one that's coming soon for season four of Stranger Things. Uh, also wrote episodes of Narcos and two really good episodes of The Walking Dead as well. So uh, so yeah, really interested to see uh, Curtis Gwynn ch- hop over to the animated uh, scene with Invincible. Yeah, and you, you, look, you gotta love... In my opinion... You gotta love Stranger Things. Like, it's just that nostalgia. So he's Absolutely. also bringing that nostalgia to this. Yeah, yeah, it's a lot of fun. Um, I, I think Stranger Things is a show that we certainly binge over the course of a weekend yes. whenever it comes out. It's one of those shows. Uh, and don't ever podcast never about think it, about it again. <laughs> then <laughs> the next season go, I hope they do a recap of the previous season. This. <laughs> uh, but this episode was directed by Paul Firminger. Uh, Paul worked on Dark Matter and also on the Mortal Kombat Legacy TV show, Chris. I know you remember that one yeah. as well. Yeah, I great love great it. With it. Yeah. Speaking of Mortal Kombat, the new film is out very soon as well, which I'm Next going to be week, very interested to see. Hey, look, they're they're saying all the right things. I'm a, I'm a Mortal Kombat game fan for many many years. They're saying all the right things, and the the trailer looks batty. Uh, I'll say again. <laughs> when you say they're saying all the right things, they're essentially saying get over here. Well, I, I mean, the people behind it are telling me that they really <laughs> like the property and they really want to do something good with it and something fun, and that's all I want: some fun, punchy, punchy fight, fight. Uh, that's pretty much what I want. The the game storyline isn't exactly the greatest in the world so i'm sure um i'm sure i can i can put up with a bad story (laughs) yes but speaking (laughs) of punchy punchy fight fight i'm gonna tell you what they gave us in this episode mark joins william and amber on a campus visit to upstate university hoping to discover a new future for himself while debbie makes her own disturbing discovery Debbie makes her own disturbing discovery is a bit of a tongue twister. I'm not going to lie. <laughs> you didn't realize that before you read it, did you, Chris? No! <laughs> <laughs> but that pretty much covers the episode. Uh, we're going to talk about three major points from the episode overall, and one of them isn't in the synopsis. Um, I wanted to talk about Eve, or Samantha, finding her place, because we didn't really talk about her last episode, Chris, no. in, in episode five. Uh, there was that really interesting argument, uh, I thought, between herself and her dad uh, and, her, and her mother in some senses, m- mother more so uh, backing up the argument with her father. And it's revisited here in episode six, um, where we have her father telling her, you know, the, the moment that you got powers was the worst day of my life, effectively. Um, in the last episode, he was kind of saying that she broke up with Rex, so therefore she should give up the superhero games because who's going to protect her, basically, is, is kind of the, the argument that's going on. Um this time it's it's very much she's going off to do something and pursue a real world of saving the world as opposed to being a superhero punching in aliens is, is kind of the the discussion that she has with yeah. Mark. Um, but I just wanted to call out one moment of the argument that I really liked. I love that she did that as her father's running out the door to try and uh, stop her from leaving. Um, she makes the door disappear and turns it back into the side of the house. I think that is such a fun use of the powers that she has. I, I just love it. <laughs> like she, it's the best part. Like you do forget how powerful she is, Atomic Keith, and then it's just these little displays, especially later on, which we'll discuss in a bit. Mm-hmm. But this, that for me was like, I'd love to have that power during an argument. It's like, oh yeah. I'm sorry, I can't hear you. There's a wall in our way. <laughs> exactly. Um, you tried to slam the door yeah. at the end of your argument. No, I'm gonna, I'm gonna take it all completely and put a wall in place. Yeah, you say we forget about how powerful Eve is. I don't think we've seen how powerful she is until this episode. This nope. feels Dr. Manhattan levels of yep. power from, from Watchmen. Oh, it's essentially that. It, she is. She can rearrange the, the atoms mm-hmm. of anything. She can rearrange matter. 
So she creates fire. She they get into it a lot later in mm-hmm. the in the comic books, but yeah, she she yeah. rearranges stuff. So we do get to see her grow crops, yeah, or accelerate the growth of crops through the the matter. She turns the mudslide into actual dried mudslide. Mm-hmm. She <sighs> removes the door. Like yeah, every yeah. she creates a treehouse. Absolutely, is scratching. amazing. And that's the one that really reminded me of of Doctor Manhattan from the comic books, from from Watchmen comic books, where he goes to Mars and sets up his own uh, his own palace, effectively from nothing. Uh, I suppose the pair is quite similar to uh, to Scarlet Witch as well. That we just we just covered one division quite recently, but yep. the comic book Scarlet Witch is a very similar kind of power to her. But uh, I, I really like this idea of her um, deciding that she's going to go off and use her powers for good. I thought it was a really interesting storyline to give this character, where you know this would tend to be the the way these stories go is. Your greatest aim is to go and join the Justice League effectively in DC or the Avengers in Marvel. You know, in, in this show, she has yeah. the opportunity to go and join Guardians of the Globe, but actually she chooses to use her powers for real good stuff that you can actually see and, and you can actually save people. And it's, other people can take care of the, the fighting effectively, which I really like that choice. Yeah, it, it's that... Um... You, you hear this at the odd time in some of the more deeper conversations, like when we see in, say, I was I was going to say some of the deeper comic books mm-hmm. and, or, or the 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 MCU now in the, the Disney plus MCU. Mm-hmm. Like a lot of the, the superhero shows we've seen today don't have the chance to get into this moralistic debate to a degree. Like mm-hmm. it's just like, OK, do I use my powers to stop a bad guy or do I use my which inherently is good because yep. I'm a good guy stopping a bad guy, or do I use my powers to, as Eve does, just essentially like fix the world, mm-hmm. save people, grow crops, fix forest fires, everything? Yeah, yeah, I, I really like it, and I know her powers are so different from all the rest of the of the yeah. people around her. You know, it's, it it would makes a lot of sense if you become a strong man to go and punch bad guys in the face. That makes a lot of sense. Whereas Eve can actually use her powers to save the world. And I, I yeah, I think that's really interesting. You see her looking at her phone and picking up things like the forest fire, um, like the the landslide. Um, they're all around the world in different countries as well. So she's traveling from her new base to different places, to Los Angeles, to Alaska, I think are the two that I saw uh, notifications on her phone effectively. Uh, so she's so she is really going out being the superhero. And you kind of think, okay, Captain Planet has come to life in uh, in Invincible here. Uh, but, I do, but I think it's, it's really interesting. And I love that it ends with her really happy with that. She yeah. has a satisfying day as a superhero because she's been questioning all along why she should be doing this and now it feels like she's made the right decision for her which is kind of interesting yeah the one day the a nice touch that i saw in the overall just the animation is when she collapses on the bed to sleep she's dirty after putting out a forest fire and doing a day's work she actually has scruff marks and dirt on her and i was like it's just it's a little touch but it just it versus the clean uniform. She's yeah. actually kind of yeah. She's put in the hard work and she looks like she's put in the hard work. And it's so it's just a nice little touch on it. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Hard day's work. I like it. Uh, will we close off Eve's point there and move on to our second point, Chris? I think we need to. Yeah. Our second point. It's the ending of the episode. Mm-hmm. Debbie knows the truth. Yeah. Yeah, pretty much. This goes all the way through, really, doesn't yeah. it? Uh, Debbie's been investigating the last couple of episodes, um, but now we know for definite that she knows what's happened. I think uh, we talked about it last week on, on the episode as to what she was going to do with uh, the suit that she found of Nolan's, the suit from the battle that he had with the Guardians of the Globe. And she's taken it to Ars, the guy who created it, effectively. Yeah. Um, so he's kind of their, uh, what, what would you call him? He's kind of like their Q, I guess, if you're a James Bond fan. You know what Q is? He's the person that supplies all of the equipment. If you're an Incredibles fan, it's like Edna Mode who made all of their costumes for for all of the Incredibles. So, uh, so yeah, so it's that kind of character. And Art here once again uh, played by Mark Hamill, um, and he's the one that's found. He's gone through all the blood that's left on the suit, um, and has worked it all the way back and found the first existence of blood in the suit indicates that it is Nolan. Omni Man, who threw the first punch, uh, starting the whole thing. So I love how this plays out. This this feels really like a thriller uh, throughout the episode because you feel like Nolan has gone off the edge once, has killed all of the Guardians of the Globe in the first episode. So every time he gives a look, and of course it's underlined by the artwork in the in the in the scenes, but every time he gives a look to Archer, kind of going, 
Art's not going to survive this little uh, chat that they're having. And then even towards the end of the episode, when he's when he's looking on his wife and she's uh, Debbie, when she's uh, talking back to him, effectively t- telling him that she knows what's happening. Um, you're kind of feeling he's going to he's going to take her out. Um, I think, yeah. Right there with you on the art and Debbie kind of analysis piece. Mm-hmm. Thought that was cool, where they broke down the, the different abrasions from the Red Rush. Yeah. And all that. Like, there's like, oh, well, that's it. Like, it was just, they were breaking down each of the powers. And then mm-hmm. it was the, basically the blood analysis that he threw the first. And I was like, oh, that's really cool. Yeah. When Nolan drinks with art, uh-huh. I honestly thought they were going to kill art off yes like i thought we were going to see and it was those pauses and again this is why i love this show no uh yes it's essentially why i love the show but it's Uh additionally like it was just the why i think jk simmons is still one of the most prominent voice actors or should actors in general because you're not Mm -hmm. just a voice actor same with mark hamill having these two powerhouses able to have this conversation probably not talking to each other in real life yeah when they're recording the vo but uh like just the the dramatic pause when he's like holding the bottle and flicking the head off uh, the cap off the bottle mm-hmm. just you're like oh just so perfectly underlined absolutely it's even just nature. his delivery of the line to Irish where he's saying you seem kind of nervous tonight yeah and you're kind of thinking, we're never seeing Art again, yeah. are we? That's the no. last time we ever see him in the show. <laughs> um, and then, yeah, as you said, so the drunken Debbie, mm-hmm. like that scene is palpable. You can cut the tension because it's just go to bed. Or no, it was like, Debbie, you're drunk. And she mm-hmm. then throws the bottle at him. Yeah. And he catches it, and then it's he's like she goes to bed. He smashes the the bottle in his mm-hmm. bare hands, and then punches a hole in the wall. Exactly, which yeah. is just amazing. Yeah, absolutely. And I think it's all kind of ramping up in the episode on Nolan's side more than anything else because we saw the moment uh, earlier on in the episode when Cecil is questioning him about. Uh, parenting on Vultrum, basically, because yeah. Mark went against uh, Nolan's wishes last episode. Uh, and Nolan's kind of going, that never happens on my planet. And Cecil's saying to him, kind of funny, isn't it? He's a, he's a human teenager. Uh, they always go against what their parents' wishes are. You're going to have to get used to that. It's kind of okay that that's happening with him because it makes him feel a bit more normal, doesn't it? Uh, and Nolan seems completely aggrieved by this. And I think that takes him all the way through the episode. You hear him having that line with in that conversation with, with Art where he's saying, you think you have everything sorted, you think you have everything settled, and then suddenly on a dime, everything changes effectively, yeah. uh, which is why you think he's maybe going to enact a plan that he's been waiting to enact maybe at this point, or, uh, or he is going to cut and run on uh, on Debbie and Mark uh, potentially he has reasons to dislike how the two of them are treating him because he feels he deserves everything and deserves everybody listening to him and following exactly what he wants uh, so I really like that in this episode yeah the framing at the end as well where you see Nolan in that hole through the hole mm-hmm. which is sitting on the couch and he it's is he going to enact the next phase of his plan mm-hmm. essentially like you see the devastation devastation i suppose the forlorn in him as he's kind yeah. of just sitting on that couch after that yeah. fight with debbie and it's just it's really interesting to like i i'm genuinely interested to see how they take this next step because mm-hmm. debbie is just essentially confirmed to nolan she knows he killed the guardians art yeah. he he knows art knows that yeah. they killed the guard like the ruse is very much up Mm-hmm. If you will, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. So, uh, so that's kind of the been the investigation for the first couple of episodes. So uh, we want to see how that plays out uh, as we go into the next episode. But let's get into the main body in our final uh, 
big point, I suppose, for the episode. The main body of the episode is the trip to Upstate University uh, with Mark and Amber uh, going up with William, who's um, following a, a little uh, summer fling he had uh, the previous year. He's trying to find uh, Rick, uh, who is uh, up in Upstate University. I had a feeling this was going to play out differently in the episode for, when the original uh, kind of conversations going on with William. I had this feeling that they were going to get there and Rick's going to go, who are you? <laughs> uh, it felt like he was just following him up to the university. Uh, this... I said this to Chris just off air before we started the episode that this episode of uh, Invincible felt absolutely the way I thought this show was going to be. Uh, when I saw the trailers for it, I'd only read a small amount of the comic books and a long, long time ago. Um, so I didn't have a huge amount of memory of how of how the storyline plays out. But this episode felt like uh, exactly what I expected. A kid, a normal teenager getting superpowers how he deals with them in a kind of an ultra violent version of the world yeah. um so this whole storyline of him going to the university and and meeting some kind of battle on a campus uh, having to save the girlfriend and the best friend you know all of that of those elements felt really familiar and felt like i thought this was going to be how the whole series played out and we're here in episode six and it's the first time we've seen uh, this kind of story in the show yeah i and i i, I love how we got there because it's not just essentially he Mark's nearly been killed. He's come to the realization that he he wants more from life. Maybe he does want to go to college, mm. but he wants to also essentially have um have the relationship restart, rekindle, which is crazy to say his relationship with Amber after, again, yeah. again after disappearing for a couple of days because he mm-hmm. was quote unquote hit by a bus yep <laughs> um which i still i think is fantastic yeah. um i love that she even comments like you look like you got hit by a bus so that wasn't actually a joke <laughs> <laughs> um but that's cool like that is the how they got there which is like they in a, even a grown-up way they essentially this the, he was nearly on death's door and he has a epiphany that he wants to there's more to life for him then being invincible mm-hmm. and yeah it's it's good it, then it does lead into as you said it's that typical peter parker blue beetle like impulse teenage superhero like trying to balance the world mm-hmm. and even to beyond that i also like how they um, I think you you wrote the notes for this one, so I I'm gonna steal. I'm gonna <laughs> steal one of the parts you say. Go right ahead. Which is essentially during the 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 first appearance, or at the end of the first appearance of the Rihanna men. There, they, Mark disappears to save them, but Amber mm-hmm. flips out because yeah, he disappeared. Whereas in Superman, like like essentially, Lois always just goes oh clark you disappeared that's so funny or Mm -hmm. mj says it to peter or all of those things whereas this is why one of the reasons i always liked invincible because it does it pulls tropes on their head now i know me talking about tropes is becoming a trope in itself for a long (laughs) Uh time listeners um but it's it's that fun part which is like no like they nearly essentially break up over this absolutely again anyway i'm getting ahead of us Let's jump back to the beginning when they arrive on campus. Mm-hmm. I do like that introduction of Rick. Absolutely, yeah. I love. I love that uh, that they have that that great kind of cut moment where they get into the car. They have a bit of a chat for a second, and then um, and then you have Amber asking William to tell her about Rick. And then it cuts to whatever it is about an hour and a half later in the all drive, right. and and William is still talking about Rick and goes, um, "I think that's about all, right? We're here now." And then he starts to talk again about Rick, and you realize from Mark and Amber's reaction that he's talked the entire way about, yeah. about this guy, Rick. But I like the character as well, the, the character of Rick that they introduce. You're kind of going, yeah, I can see why William likes this guy. He seems like a really uh, a really interesting guy. He seems uh, seems uh, really assertive, seems like a really nice guy, uh, seems really cool, uh, seems really into, uh, into, into all three of them hanging out and, and enjoying themselves up here at the university. Um, but they have their first run-in with our big bad of the episode, I guess, of with D.A. Sinclair when uh, they meet him in a, a biology class where Sinclair is effectively telling 
everybody in the room who will listen that the problem is humans. The problem is not our biology. We can get past that. So kind of showing the intention of this character, someone that believes that uh, by enhancing humans, we can move on to the next level effectively is the way that I, I'm taking D.A. Sinclair. Yeah, no, exactly. And perfectly voiced by who I did not catch until the end. Ezra Miller. Ezra Miller, flash himself for just know. sake. Yeah. Just like the the sinister take, the sinister undertones of the voice. Mm-hmm. I was just like, it wasn't until uh, essentially I kind of looked through who was in which, through who was in the episode via the x ray. Uh-huh. I was like, what? Oh, because we also <laughs> do get another cameo in this episode as well. Yes, we do. Um, which right at the beginning, Doug Cheston. Who is voiced by, straight away I got it, Justin Roiland of Rick and Morty fame. Absolutely. Do you know why he got it straight away, Chris? Because the first thing he says is he burps. Yeah. And that is that is initially how Rick is introduced in every episode, I think, of, of Rick and Morty. So, or every scene of Rick and Morty, uh, Rick burps. So uh, you get like, I recognize that burp. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, you know that's a callback to Justin Rowling. You know that's in the in the scene because it's Justin here. He has to burp, right? Yeah. And it was, but that was the thing. Like, it's, again, like, I, I just, it was fantastic to see these two very, distinct cameos Mm -hmm. but they're not just a walk-on cameo like okay you're not a walk-on cameo in an animated show but it's not just a cameo for the sake of being a cameo Mm -hmm. like both Doug and obviously D.A. Sinclair are pivotal characters in this episode yeah absolutely like I I know the we don't hear from uh from uh, Doug, after a certain point, when his uh, when his voice box is removed, effectively, <laughs> uh, when his vo- <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Um, but the actual character, I loved how this played out. Where you you kind of he's almost like the Frankenstein monster in a way. It, it, the way it plays out, he's tr- he, he looks like he's trying to reach out to get help from people when he escapes uh, from being captured by uh, by Sinclair. Um, but because he has no vocal cords and because he looks like a monster, everybody's screaming around him, effectively. Yeah. Um, and then he gets into the battle uh, with with Invincible and is kind of, it seems like he could be fighting back rather than attacking. At some point, he's kind of frustrated, I suppose, and punches out uh, is what it feels like. And then he has the battle and then sees what he looks like. You know, um, we kind of see from before he's been turned into, I think you mentioned the the type of character name they're called Rihanna Men uh, in the comic book. So he's turned into the first Rihanna Man um, and he has that battle. But uh but before we saw him trans- transformed, we saw that he's a really arrogant character to begin with. So you could see him having a fight with somebody that stands up to him. You could see he's that kind of bully type of character uh, because he's got all of daddy's money behind him kind of thing. So you can almost see, even because he doesn't realize what he's become, that he's and he can't tell anybody what he's become. He can't talk to anybody at all. It feels like that's why he gets into this fight. Yeah. And then the moment he sees himself in the water of the uh, just below the sundial he decides to kill himself on the sundial that's a brutal little moment there that we have as he jumps in the air and you think it's him attacking mark but yeah. it turns out he's jumping up jumping up to stab himself on the sundial yeah and straight from the comic books but mm-hmm. again the translation of the source material the, the the amount they say true to the comic books is staggering mm-hmm. i did not th- now now we don't see it directly in the comic books it's just it's done off panel and implied and thing that's right i saw that in the x-ray just a, a, another shout out to amazon's x-ray feature i think oh, yeah. it's absolutely yeah. fantastic but they they mentioned that this whole scene takes place exactly as as is in the comic but uh, they mentioned that this uh, that this moment the actual death you don't see on panel and it's one of the only times in Invincible you don't see the violence in panel which is interesting so they actually showed it on screen <laughs> I'd love to know why yeah. because I, I remember because I did and then because I assumed they would do the exact same thing yeah which I did not think they would show I the self impalement is the only way to put it mm-hmm. Um, but they did and I was like yeah. cool like that <laughs> you, you are giving me what I want when I wanted this show like you're giving me the blood gore, but at the same time, then you're giving me the drama. Yeah. I didn't know I wanted a high school <laughs> drama, but I do. Obviously, I I have a I like I, I I have a soft spot, obviously, for high school drama. Being a fan of Spider Man and all that, of course. but um, yeah. 
And your favorite era is when he's in high school, right? Yeah, yeah high school. Yep. Yeah, yeah. Um, and like, uh, like even better, like the Ultimate Universe. But anyway, it's a whole right. other, <laughs> it's a whole other piece. But, but essentially, they, like, which is like the 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 drama that unfolds from just like this battle. Like, mm-hmm. well, first of all, Will now knows incredible's secret identity yes he does yes he does and i love uh unlike all of the other episodes where um mark says his name we don't hear it we just see the the titles and we see that in this episode as well uh when da sinclair says to uh doug cheston i'm gonna make you and then it comes up the credits in this episode uh but we hear william repeatedly shouting at him you're invincible you're invincible uh which i thought was really funny and i like you know it feels uh, really natural for this character who's clearly known mark since they were kids uh really natural for him to be going why didn't you tell me about that why didn't you why, why can't you show me your superpowers or why haven't you shown me and then take me out in a flight uh and they do it begrudgingly from mark uh drags him out uh, out the window and take him off uh on on his uh on a quick flight around the area um but i think i, I love that idea that william already knows you know it makes total sense that uh that these characters would know about uh, about their best friend dressing up as a as a superhero um I suppose it's kind of been laid since the first episode. It's not a surprise that they will find out about him because since the first episode, there's what, uh, at least Eve actually is in school with Mark. So she knows almost immediately the first conversation there between them. So Mark was never going to keep the secret from his best friend. No, no. And we do start to immediately get this running gag from the comic books where um, Will is essentially asking to be uh, flown around mm-hmm. by Mark uh, to wear the costume. And it's an ongoing thing. It continues right. it like, and it's, they're already doing it now. And I was oh, again, I just why I love the show. It's just, <laughs> you, if you find out your best friend can fly and is a well-known superhero, you're going to be like, yeah, can you, can you take me for a flight? And he's like, well, done, done. all right, <laughs> can, can I wear the costume? Absolutely, I, I like that he had a, a better experience of it in, than MJ did in uh, in the most recent Spider Man movie, where he tries to take her swinging around the city, and she's like, "I'm done, never yeah. want to do that again." <laughs> <laughs> but you you did mention the Spider Man touch point from comic books. This the other thing this really touches on is I think it's season five of uh, Buffy when Buffy goes to college. Effectively, um, there are so many of these kind of storylines that are in that season of Buffy where it starts out with some nefarious thing going on on campus. Then you see your main characters uh, going about their daily business. And then by the end of it, your main characters are incorporated into this crazy stuff that's going on on campus. And the new character introduced, which is in this episode, Rick, has suddenly been captured by the bad guy effectively. So this story, this arc of this story is so familiar to me as a Buffy fan. I feel like it's, it's like, it's like Buffy 101 or Buffy season 501, uh, let's say, um, (laughs) But it, it is a bit of a surprise that Rick's gone and, and converted into one of the Anna men. Um, they have they have their battle and, and everything, you know, everything goes on the way you would expect to happen. The one thing I wasn't expecting probably is how far they go with, with William here. Um, it felt like he was about to lose an arm as well. Uh, mm-hmm. in this episode he captured and almost loses an arm. Um, what did you think of these moments? It may be comic book stuff, but, um, but how it was how it played out on screen here by uh, by Rick being taken and may never come back from that. I, I love this. This is all comic book stuff. So mm. I'll, I'll pull that out. Like, I'm not surprised by any of these turn events. From the Rick and Will perspective, this is as pretty much like the beats are there, the same beats yeah. and things like that. So I wasn't shocked by any of it. I loved mm. how it played out, though. I loved the overall... <laughs> The drama? Yeah. I love the overall drama of it. Like, mm-hmm. like because it did look like for a second that they were going to take William's arm. Uh-huh. And I actually for a second was like, oh, wait, wait, are they going to take, are they going to do that and give him like one of the Rihanna men arms? That'd uh-huh. be cool. That'd be different. Yeah. I'm, I'm down. Yeah, Let's have a look. And like, they nearly, like, they, they keep you up to that part. Yeah. Well, like it's it's literally the drill is going into his arm, yeah. or the saw is going into his arm, and you know Kirkman does have precedence for that. He did he did take Rick Grimes' arm uh, about halfway through the comic book, so yeah. uh, so you kind of think maybe he'll do that to William this time. Yeah, I I love that part of it, and I I the the going back to the drama aspect before we talk about how it all wraps up with a bow, mm-hmm. the the Amber scene where this is the comic book fun part where the hero 
has to choose between superheroing and saving the greater good. So mm-hmm. saving people for the greater good. In this case, his best friend's boyfriend yeah. versus his love life. So yeah. we see Amber basically in a frat house with this other frat guy who has a girlfriend but wonders, is Amber single? Mm-hmm. And Mark's there. He gets to the frat house, but he has to go save Rick and William. Like, And he can't he can't kind of save his very much destructive relationship mm-hmm. <laughs> because he has to go save and destroy someone else. And I, that's the drama I live for in these kind of <laughs> bits because you're like, right. oh, it's the poor, like, it's the way it plays out. It's just, yeah, it's Buffy, it's Spider-Man, it's mm-hmm. just that essential piece. Um, I thought it was just really fun. Well done. Excellent. Excellent. Um, I I also like how the how this final battle plays out uh, yeah. as well. I, I like that William gets a few shots in as well. You know, like he's just lost a, a potential boyfriend. Uh, you know, he even calls out in the episode. I don't know where I love the guy. I only met him once, and now I'm coming up to visit him in, in the university. So they're not they're not actually an item, let's say. But he has traveled a long way to meet uh, to meet Rick. Um, but he does get a few shots in to uh, to um, D. A. Sinclair after. Uh, he's been attacked but i kind of like that he gets that in any way but we do get that excellent punch from mark to just shut it all down uh, as he breaks uh sinclair's jaw which is brutal looking uh on screen <laughs> yeah i did not expect they'd show that like that that looked it was more okay, the, the the actual act itself Meh, it's fine. We've seen worse. Mm-hmm. It was the bit where they have the S here on the stretcher, and his jaws just like yeah, like two foot over the other direction, <laughs> and you're yeah. like, oh, oh, I- like that's. I don't know why I cringe more at that than than pulling out the uh, like compartment or the the chip out of the Reanimans kind of head mm-hmm. and the gore and the blood coming out. That didn't. Nope, nothing on that. But just seeing the. The jaw over that, I'm like, oh, oh no, that hurt. Oh, oh. I know. I was, I was actually watching the episode with John, their other co-host on on the podcast, uh, and that was instantly he was watching the episode, going, "Did he just break his jaw?" And we're both going, "Nah, I don't think so." He punched him really hard in the face, like superheroes do. And then, then, then that scene came up on the stretcher when we see uh, the jaw almost removed uh, yeah. from from Sinclair. Uh, that's what he gets for removing people's vocal cords. Uh, one other thing I liked about the resolution to this to this is that it is William calling out uh, to Rick to to realize you know who he is in the past you know and, and bringing back his humanity so there is potential the gda turn up the global defense agency with cecil turn up and take them away and they do say they're going to work on the rihanna men and see if they can get them back to being the students they were beforehand not sure whether that's going to happen but at least they're going to try yeah exactly they're going to try yeah the cecil's um all at the tech oh yeah yeah that, I love how they plant the seeds. They're just mm-hmm. like, just the delivery. It's like, this is really good for being built in a sewer. And you're like, yeah. oh, no, what by, are you going to do with it? By a college student. Hmm. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> who can't talk now? Oh, right. Hmm. Yeah, that, that did seem quite interesting and, and possibly referring to something that might happen in the future. Yeah. Um, there is that thing we, we, we mentioned a few times before, but just to reiterate that they seem to be looking for something that will stop Omni-Man if they ever need to. And yep. now they have Mark, who's also very powerful, who they may need to stop in the future. So uh, so when Cecil's talking to Mark, kind of going, they put up a very good fight with you and considering yeah. uh, considering being built by a college student, hmm, maybe that's something we need to consider in the future, I think. Yeah, and it's fun how they're laying seeds like this in episode six of season one. Mm-hmm. Like that potentially could play out in season three, if they get season three or season two. Absolutely. Or etc. Um, I just, I love this. I loved how it's resolved. It's just, it's, as you said, it's that college episode. It's that two degree monster of the week, but not monster of the week yeah, yeah. piece. Um, but it's still fun. It, it, it like, I, okay, I don't know if I could do like a, a 20 episode mm-hmm. arc of this. Yeah. But one within. At one out of six so far like yeah get yeah. like throw me one of these every now and again like this is the, the self-contained story to a degree i'm all right that throw, sprinkle in some major story beats like with atomic eve and um 
and with Debbie and stuff. And yeah, I'm I'm down. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Do you think that helps as well, knowing that it's only eight episodes of the show? Um, when you get these kind of episodes, like if you if if as you say, even if you're watching this and it was the sixth episode of the first season and you knew you had another fourteen to go until the end of the season, would this feel a bit like oh god, get move on the story, or do you think? It's fine because we only have two more to go in an eight episode season like we have now. I think it's if if we got multiple of these, mm. that's where the question mark would start to become that you're like, okay, you're just mm-hmm. doing a lot of filler, like Yeah. I think this as a self contained one off mm-hmm. because I do know it is short. It's still like it's nearly eight hours, just what, seven hours of a show. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. God. Um I, I think it, it's nice. Because at the same, it moved along. That's the thing. I think that's the way, the part that I loved. It was self-contained, but it still moved the story along because we'll talk about, let's do it. Let's move on to our notes because there are other parts to this episode that happened that additionally move on parts of the story. So yeah. they managed to tell the, the, the Atomic Eve story, the Debbie and Nolan story, which is one of the big overarching series arcs Mm -hmm. and they told the self-contained and then they sprinkled in these nice little other bits the first being the Mahler twins so like robot we do see something growing in the tube with the Mahler twins i love this scene i love this piece of artwork of the brain the eyes the uh the internal circulatory system and and a a little some organs basically and i love that the Mahler twins are trying to hold it over robot kind of going well we're halfway through so we want our prize now effectively um but robots not having any of it so uh so yeah i'm sure that'll play out uh, in the future but they do set up the post credit scene or the just after the two seconds of credit scene uh <laughs> that we get they set that up saying that they're that they're going to go up and get some insurance for themselves effectively um what we see is two kids digging up the body of the immortal and i love this interaction between the two kids where they're saying they uh one one of them uh, is saying that he learned it from reddit that uh, if you uh, drink alcohol out of the uh, the head of the immortal then you get his powers um of course once again character played by justin roiland also involving alcohol uh, once again so uh, so yeah definitely making references to rick and morty uh, and the other kid there is the uh, is the stepson of the uh, security guard from uh, the white house from episode one and episode two so uh, so he's coming back uh, as the episodes go on which is which is really good fun and um, so are the mauler twins going in to dig up the body of the immortal and uh, and get that power for themselves or hold that power over somebody is that that what we're expected to believe here is that uh i, I again am i like, guessing who, right Chris? who knows who knows what you're <laughs> guessing like but like this is the bit i loved like it was just well first of all who knew the storyline i actually really care about is the the stepfather and the stepson mm-hmm. like that has been <laughs> <laughs> sprinkled in over six episodes and i'm like as soon as they said it was talking about his stepdad i was like oh my god that's the kid from the versus oh my <laughs> exactly. god i'm like that's a storyline i never knew i wanted but now i do want to know more I love um, it. I love it. and yeah like this this it's the little characters that matter here in yeah. the Robert Cookman's world. <laughs> it really is. And it was just it. Like, finding out like, the Mon Twins are going to get the like the Immortal's body. And they're like, oh mm. my god, okay. Like, why Like why are they doing this? And mm-hmm. it's two seconds. Because we do know that they, they want to get... To, like, But the question is, yeah, do they want the power? Do they want to become Immortal? Do they want to resurrect the Immortal? Mm-hmm. Do they, like... Do they want to cut off his head and drink him a skull? Who knows? Sounds like a Friday fun. night for the Baller Twins. Yeah, huh? Exactly. <laughs> um, we also get one other kind of storyline, which is yeah. the, the repercussions of the Guardians of the Globe going up against Machine Head and his group. Mm-hmm. Um, be- essentially, like Monster Girl, that, that scene is traumatic, where she's like going in and out of her kind of transformation like mm-hmm. as they're all wheeled into the emergency room you have like they can't prick her skin and she's transforming and she's transforming back to human and then back to a monster girl mm-hmm. with her face still gone yeah with with like portions of teeth gone yeah. and broken nose and stuff yeah i thought that was really interesting and it I'm also wondering about that uh, robot being involved in that and robot being involved in saving her seems to um, seems to go into a 
a mystical way of dealing with her in some senses. Mm-hmm. He he goes to find a plant that only grows uh, in, in the Arctic and um, brings that back. Definitely loved the moment when you saw a broken down version of Robot coming into the room and falling down dead, effectively. Yeah. If robots can die. Uh, that's a theoretical discussion thing still, I think. Um, but, but Robot comes in afterwards and that's just one of the other robots that he builds. Um, but I love that. I love how they how they played that. I thought that was really good. Um, but interestingly, he doesn't do anything for Samson. Um, Black Samson kind of reinvigorates himself and comes back to life himself yeah. in some very strange way. Some kind of light beam comes out of him, restores him to health, and then he's back alive the next time every season. But we talked about it last episode as being possibly the end of those characters because of how brutalized they yeah. were uh, in the attack. So I was kind of surprised that both of them were back alive this episode. The, the fact they've given Black Samson his powers again, because the, the, the storyline that we kind of have in the background, but we haven't yes. been fully told, which is he was a member of the Guardians Globe, lost mm-hmm. his powers... Yep. was wearing the suit and was like Rex Blode constantly gives out to him or kind of ribs him that he doesn't have any powers. Yeah. And then his powers kind of inexplicably return and give him a bit like the jolt of life. Yeah, he says something here, doesn't he, just after getting him back that he feels better than he has in years. Yes. Back to when he had this powers. That's what it is. Yeah. yeah. So it's going to be interesting whether they actually continue on with him having his powers now mm. or is it, it's going to be cool to see. Um the, How did he get them back? Is, yeah. is interesting too. Yeah, is it, is it just get close to death and uh, and re, be reborn or something? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, the emotional discussion regarding robot and monster girl is interesting. Mm-hmm. They're, they're this budding relationship, if you want to call it that, yeah. uh, the slagging about do robots even have emotions? Mm-hmm. As I said, it's a it's a discussion. Do like robots drink dream electric dreams kind of level of stuff. Dream of Electric Sheep. Oh, there you go. That's even better. <laughs> it's, it's, it's the the original title of Blade Runner, Chris. Yes. There you go. There you go. Thank you. <laughs> um, but yeah, they have these stories. It's essentially this. Why I love this. Like the, even for this one-off filler, self-contained story episode, mm-hmm. we get all these other threads that are pushing the story along. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's just fantastic. Excellent. But, Derek, I think that's the end of our points and our notes. Mm-hmm. So you know what that means. I have to ask you, do you defend episode six of Invincible? You look kind of dead. Yeah, I defend this episode. As I said earlier on, it's weird, isn't it? I came into the show expecting every episode to be like this and then was blown away by the first five episodes being completely different to what I thought. And now I've got episode six and I'm going, yeah, this is what I thought. And I was going to watch the show because of thinking the show was going to be like episode six. So so how could I not defend that? It ended up delivering exactly what I expected. A Buffy episode uh, in, a co- in a cartoon world, uh, basically. <laughs> so yes, I definitely defend it. Chris, how about yourself? Do you defend this episode of Invincible? I do. 100% because for the exact same reasons that you do, mm-hmm. but also more that I don't mind it having this episode. Yeah. Like I could watch at least two of these episodes in the season because they're just self-contained. They're nice. They're breather episodes, if you want yep. to call it that. But at the same time, they moved enough of the other storylines along that it was only upon second watch. That I went, oh yeah, okay, not that much happened, but enough did happen that, like, the storyline moved. Like, you still got, like, 10 to 12 minutes of other storyline that has pushed forward. I'm like, okay, this is great. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I 100% defend this, Excellent. because this is what I'm here for. Yeah. More Invincible. And that, and that's why you do TV shows, not movies, as well, for these things. So you yeah. can have these explorations of character and a bit more time with them and see what their day-to-day is like, rather yeah. than rather than just having the movies. Uh, I know we have another show that we're covering that that's, that that's happening on as well. So, yeah. Exactly. Okay. Well, there we have all of our defense and our yes. notes and our points. But I think you wanted to introduce a new section. Yes. Into yes. Um, we have been saying since the beginning that, uh, that I'm not a comic book reader. Uh, Chris is a comic book reader, but read them all a while ago and is a big fan of the comics, of course. But there are things, as always... We will get wrong over the course of our time on TV podcast industry. Six years, 570 episodes about multiple, multiple TV shows. We do get things wrong occasionally. But it's time to introduce Correction Corner uh, on all of our shows 
uh, from now on because when we get things wrong we want you to email us and tell us what it is we've got wrong you can contact us on facebook uh, over on our facebook group at facebook.com slash groups slash tv podcast industries tell us if there's something we got wrong on our podcast or email us to feedback at tv podcast industries.com and let us know what it is we got wrong i'll take the first one uh, the first one we got wrong a couple of weeks ago we uh, talked about the actor uh, digimon hanso and I pronounced it exactly like that, completely incorrectly. Uh, Will be just sent some messages on Twitter to say, uh, just to confirm, Jaimon Hanso pronounces his name Jaimon, just like Simon, the D is silent. So both of us, I think, actually pronounce yep. it as Digimon. And I don't know why, because I've seen him in interviews many times, heard his name pronounced as Jaimon Hanso many times. So my apologies. That's the uh, first of our correction corner. I will now, that is now indelibly burned into the back of my head. Yes, and we do apologise to Diamond, who we know listens to this podcast. He doesn't listen to this podcast. We don't <laughs> listen to this podcast. If you are, we apologise. But, uh, yeah, I it, it, it don't know why it was just there. It's like Gal Gadot. Every now and again, I'll just go, I'll say Gal Gadot. And I know mm-hmm. that's wrong. Yeah. But it's just in my head, and it's just like, bleh. See, I think that comes from doing French when we were kids, and you kind of think if there's a T on the end of it, then that's probably silent, and that's maybe where we get it from. But yeah, Gal Gadot, definitely. Uh, thanks so much for that, Will. Thank you so much, Will. We also got some feedback from Timothy Langston, who said, Tassel, how do you not know Tether Tyrant? Have you not read the comic books? <laughs> Thank you, Tim, for that feedback. Yes, I have read the comic books. Uh, all 146 of them a long time ago. Uh and I'm actually rereading them, but come on. <laughs> Thank I can't believe you. you missed it, Chris. Yes. Uh, <laughs> I was calling Tether Tyrant the the gentleman in the last episode, episode five, with the pink tassels. Tassel. Um, how dare I? No. Thank you so much for this. This is the funny thing. But yes, I, I completely mispronounced, misinterpreted the name completely yep. got not even misinterpreted got it wrong <laughs> so thank you for pointing that out i love Excellent. this because Excellent. much like gi joe the more you know absolutely absolutely the more you know the better yes. uh, thanks so much timothy if you do see any more that we forget or uh, have mispronounced or anything else that we've uh, missed on our episodes send them into correction quarter we do also have some other feedback though on the other episodes uh, chris farmer got in contact with us by email over feedback at tvpodcastindustries.com and says i had two invincible items that i was hoping you'd mentioned on the podcast in episode three's opening scene we see archaeologists uncover some kind of ancient spirit but the scene just ends up and was not mentioned again was that a reference to something that happened earlier on uh, another bag of burger mart meat thrown into the air that i forgot about um I think actually, Chris, you meant, you did actually mention this towards the end of the episode. I was saying that I had loads of notes about this and you mentioned that actually it was all a setup for the fact that uh, Nolan and Mark doing their flight training covers them all up in sand and ends this possible world ending moment in just a flyby. Yeah, the storm, uh, the <laughs> gust of wind knocks the, 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 the slab of granite back in mm-hmm. front of the tomb and just stops it. And right. I was just like, it's just such a fun... Yep, this was not the thing. Well, so, sometimes you save the world accidentally. <laughs> uh, Chris continues, I also just enjoyed in episode five when Invincible starts to real t- reveal to his girlfriend why he's always late. He says, I'm, I'm, and then hesitates as if we were waiting for that title card to come up again, but then it doesn't. It reflects how Mark doesn't feel like he has any agency or confidence about his own identity. Ooh, really like that, Chris. I like that. That's good. Yeah. And he's, he, you can see the hesitation in this episode. When he's yeah. having some discussions, he's like, you can think you're about to, he's about to say it, and he's just not, and it's great. Exactly, exactly. Uh, finally, Chris says, thanks for the podcast. It feels like watching a show with friends, which is always nice these days. Ah, oh, thank you. From thanks one Chris so much, to Chris. another Chris. Thank exactly. you so much, Chris. Exactly. Thanks so much, Chris. We also got some feedback over on Facebook at facebook.com slash groups slash TV podcast industries. Uh, this one came from Dr. Bob Phillips, who had feedback on this episode, episode six, who said, oh, the melding and molding of the Mahler storyline into the new Guardians, the return of the opening sequence, step kid rebel turned almost good, <laughs> relationship fails all over the show, and finally the entry of wizardry. That's how I'm reading the pretty blue Antarctic flower to complement our cast of aliens and androids. Oh, nice. Ooh, good callback to Falcon and the Winter Soldier. Well done, <laughs> Dr. Bob Phillips. Okay. 
Well incorporated there, Dr. Yes. Bob. I like it. I like it. Uh, is this wizardry? Is it just alternative medicine? We won't know, I guess, until uh, until we see. But I, but I do like that uh, that robot when he's in those moments with the doctors. He's kind of going, I have studied her, her physiology uh, constantly for the last number of months. Uh, either help me or let her die, uh, yeah. effectively. So I really like that. So uh, whether he is using mysticism or wizardry, we won't know yet. Yes, but you know it's probably he's gone to Kung Lung, mm-hmm. beat a dragon, got a <laughs> flower, and now come back. Sure, why um, not? Yes. Thank you so much, Dr. Bob Phillips. Continue. Everyone over, we have uh, on our Facebook groups posts every Friday morning. Really, Friday morning, Derek gets up at 4 a.m. and puts up a spoiler post where you can give us your feedback for each of the episodes. Please continue to do that. Or if you want to hear your dulcet tones, on our podcast, you could head on over to tvpodcastindustries.com and leave us a voicemail or email it to feedback at tvpodcastindustries.com, much like Steve Brown. Hello, Derek, Chris, and John. This is Steve, and this is for uh, Invincible. Uh, you look kind of dead. Um, you know, I, it's interesting, and I, just a few quick things. Uh, I had to watch it twice, but... Um, Adam Eve is doing the things kind of that Mark's dad said, you know, oh, those are the things are beneath you and you shouldn't be worrying about those things. But I think this episode really showed us that Mark, uh, he's not ready for the big battles yet. Well, I guess we've seen him do big battles. I don't know. I was confused a little bit because the, the DA Sinclair guy went from, you know, one successful, uh, you know, transformation to suggly having three that were able to, uh, get, almost get the best of Invincible, but he finally came back. And so, yeah, his his powers seem a little, I don't know if it's sporadic or just because he's young, but uh, so it's going to be interesting to see if they develop that at all. Um, sad that the reaction Amber had to him saying he was going, just going to get help and she didn't believe him. We've seen that, I think, in other superhero shows, right, where the, the hero claims, oh, I was just going to get help, and it was, oh, okay, we understand, but this one time she didn't, so uh, unfortunate, and uh, I, I kind of worried about her a little bit at that party, and so I'm kind of wondering if more happened than, she she was upset about more than just her breakup with Mark. Okay, and uh, what are those guys going to do with the Immortals body? All right, uh, talk to you later. Thanks so much for the voicemail, Steve. Uh, one of the things that you just reminded me of in your voicemail, um, one of the touches I really liked in this show. So we saw this character of Doug at the start getting transformed into the Rihanna Man all the way throughout the rest of the episode. And I, I noticed in the background there are posters appearing for people missing and it is three people missing by the end of it. So uh, so D.A. Sinclair has been constantly doing improvements and constantly doing work on students that he's missing to create his better and better Rihanna men, I suppose, uh, as the episodes go on. So it feels like the reason why they're able to almost better Invincible is because, well, there's three of them and one on his own was put up a good fight against him. So um, so I don't know whether they would have beaten him completely, but they are certainly a challenge when there's multiples, uh, multiples there. Yeah, that too. And there's also, there's a comment from um, Omni-Man previous in one of the previous episodes where it's like, you need to train Mark. You need to, it's like a muscle. It's like when he's, I think it's regarding flying. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's actually that scene, which we talked about it earlier, is. where yeah. they, they, they're they flying through the desert. And he, like, it's like, you need to learn. You need to push yourself. You need to train. Yeah. Um, I don't want to get spoilery. There's a theme from the comic books about that, which is right. Mark needs to train his powers. Mm-hmm. He, he, he does need to push himself to a limit to get better and better and better. Yeah. Um, again, he's only been invincible for a couple of months. He's only literally been invincible for a couple of months. Yeah. Both yeah. in both senses of the word. And remember uh, so when he was learning. in when he was in the hospital as well, they did say he had a, a hole punched all the way through him. Luckily, it was uh, it was a sharp uh, implement that was yeah. used because uh, they weren't sure he was going to be able to come back from it. So uh, so he has been pretty badly bruised and beaten from his mass- massive battle in the last episode. So maybe this little minor battle is uh, is um, one that he can handle just about uh, at yeah. the moment because he's probably just in recovery a little bit. We'll, we'll give him, we'll give him that. Uh, you know what it's like. Sometimes uh, your superhero goes up against a very small uh, bank robber, and other times they go up against a a, a giant from another galaxy, and uh, they have to kind of say that they're around, around, the, around the same power just to give you that give you that moment of drama, I suppose. Uh, as for Amber at the uh, at the um, 
frat party that she went to. I, 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 I genuinely just thought that she was following a guy that she that had kind of shown interest in her just after uh, after kind of the split from Mark. And then when she gets there and finds out that he has a boyfriend, she's kind of going, well, I don't even know why I'm here at this party because I don't know anybody here. So she goes back to bed. I thought that's all that was. Yeah, uh, I I took it that she just went home or she was at home. She stayed in the party and then went home. Um, and the the eyes awake pretending to be asleep is just she didn't want to let Mark or William know that essentially they were back. Exactly. Like, that she knew they were back. She was pretending to be asleep. She didn't want to, have to talk to Mark. Yeah. And that's why I took from yeah. that one. Excellent. Excellent. Thanks again for all of the feedback you've been sending in for the episodes of Invincible. We have two more episodes to go of Invincible, so I know. please send us in any thoughts that you have over the next couple of weeks uh, for those two episodes. Uh, looking forward to talking more about Invincible next week. Yeah, I can't wait. But if you can't wait either, you can head on over to facebook.com slash TV Podcast Industries where you can talk to like-minded guardians and see what they thought and let us know your thoughts. You can also... Why not subscribe? Make sure you have. Leave us a review. You know, five stars. Go on. Yeah, you know, like show us how much you love it. Go on. Tell us. Tell the world. Write us a review on Apple Podcasts or just share the podcast because sharing the podcast is sharing the love. Mm -hmm. Yes, we'll be back this weekend with Falcon and the Winter, the penultimate episode of Falcon and the Winter Soldier, which aired today, the 16th of April. Chris hasn't seen it yet, so I I haven't haven't spoiled him, but it's a goodie. It is, yes, yes. And we'll be back next week discussing episode seven of Invincible. Yeah, looking forward to it. Thanks so much for joining us. Yes, keep watching, keep listening, and keep being invincible. No, you keep being invincible. Oh, don't worry, I look dead. <laughs> Bye. Bye. Bye.